I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the editor in chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Gear I from Siemens EDA, who's going to talk today about design for test data. Gear, in the past when we had design for test, it was always something that you thought about: is the thing going to work along the way? What's our testing strategy? As we go forward, as these devices get more complicated, as you get more chips in a package, you also have to now think about how is the data going to flow through this? And you need more than just the strategy for doing this, right? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. There, there are yeah, there are a couple of things that are happening really uh, at the same time. One is obviously the complexity of, um, of the designs it's themselves. So for, for manufacturing tests, for instance, we have to, to really think about how, how does the data flow from, from the tester and to the target core of the design. Because in, in current designs, we see very uh, designs with very hierarchical, complex hierarchical structures with core inside of course, inside of course. And you know, getting, getting that access uh, set up correctly is, is a challenge. The other thing we see also is that it's not just about manufacturing tests anymore. Uh, we, we see a significant increase in the number of designs and types of designs that have stricter in-system test requirements. And also the, the requirements for, for these in, especially let's say in, in automotive, the quality requirements for in-system test is, is increasing as well. So that this, this concern about getting large amounts of, of data into the chip and around the chip uh, for test is not just a manufacturing test problem, it is a in-system test uh, problem as well. And you've not only got more data, you also have longer lifetimes of these chips, right? So you have complex interactions that may not be the same five years down the road as they were when you first uh, launched this chip into the market. Uh, correct, and there are, there are many many concerns here. If, for instance, in the you know, just in in the functional domain, right, we see you know, more concern with respect to you know, taking both the be behavior of the chip into account in the sense that is it starting to behave in ways it shouldn't, either because of software bugs and you know over the lifetime of a chip, it might be uh, exposed to you know there's going to be firmware updates and and the software is going to change. There might be uh, attacks against the device. So, so for instance, the ability to, you know, to understand and monitor if the chip is actually behaving the way it's supposed to uh, functionally, uh, that is something that, you know, is a much bigger concern in, in, to, in today's devices than, than, it, than it used to be. Uh, but also in, in terms of, of tests and, and defects, we are looking for uh, degradations over time, uh, right? Because when you, uh, well, at least, I keep my cars for for ten years or more, and I you know I really want the brakes to to still function and electronics in the brakes to still function uh, ten years from now, not just when I drive it on the first day. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Gear, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this uh, is a really a simplified version of uh, the text test structures of, of most designs, most digital designs today. What, what we see here is a design with three cores and, and each core you got, you know, these uh, horizontal lines here illustrating scan chains, uh, some compression circuitry. And then you know, normally how these cores are hooked up for, for test is just wired up to chip level pins. And uh, there's usually some sort of MUX uh, circuitry here as well for both the, the actual DFT insertion and also the pattern generation, it's usually done like targeting each core for efficiency. So you don't target the whole chip, you target each core and then you just kind of wire it up like, like this. This works really well uh, in a very simple scenario like this, where you, for instance, don't have too many cores. And also where, again, you're just worried about traditional manufacturing tests, right? But there's still some, some things you have to think about here, which is that you have a lot of dependencies between these different cores. When you decide how many uh, pins you want to use for test for each core, you also need to know, okay, how many pins do I have at the chip level? And how many pins do I have at the other cores, right? So you need to kind of do, do the math and do the balancing. The problem also is that if you want to make good choices, you want to 
also take into account like how much test data do we need per core, right? So you want to, for instance, maybe allocate more test resources, more pins to the, the bigger cores, right? So you can kind of balance, uh, balance things out. One of the challenges is that you have to make these decisions like at the same time, but you very often, you don't really know, all, you don't have all the data you need to make those good decisions until after you've generated patterns, like when it's too late. Right. So, so there, there's very often here, there's a trade-off between like an efficient implementation where you do this once and for all and, and you're done and test time, right? Where you would otherwise have to go back and, and change things as you, as you get more data. What do you have to think about in terms of data flow within this? Because what you're trying to do is really narrow down where the problem may be, if there is a problem. And you also want, still want to be able to move that data through at a pretty high rate, right? Yes, that, that, that's a very good point. The, the, the one thing that you, you really have to, to think about here when you think about data flow is that when we connect things up directly here from, from the IO pins and, and really from, from the tester and, and directly to the scan chains is, um, is throughput. Because you know, even though most designs today, if you think of uh, you know, go to Best Buy and buy a new laptop, they will say your, your processor is whatever number of gigahertz. And even though, chips have really high functional frequencies today, typically you can only shift data through these scan chains at, you know, most designs today is around hundred megahertz, right? So there, there, which is fairly, fairly slow when you think about it, but there are, well, there, there are good reasons for that. But in terms of data flow, what that means is that if you got a hundred megahertz limitation at the core level through these internal test structures, when they're just wiring things up directly like this, you now also have the same frequency for the data coming in uh, from the tester and being distributed across the chip. So even though like most, uh, if we just focus on, on manufacturing tests for, for a moment, even though most testers, digital cards instruments on a tester can tackle gigahertz, right? You're, you're kind of leaving a lot of that capability on the table because you can't really shift data uh, through the chip fast enough. You want this to happen very quickly too, right? I mean, you really need to know when you're putting this, uh, particularly in the field, is this working properly? Right, yeah, in field test and, and in-system test, you're, you're really, you know, you're dealing with, in, in a way, conflicting requirements, right? In, in that, especially for, uh, for automotive applications, you have really high quality requirements. And you also have a you know, very short uh, time window to deal with, right? So especially for, for, uh, for many of the infill requirements, traditionally you have, you have sacrificed quality for, for time. So traditionally in, in many applications, the uh, test quality targets for manufacturing tests are much higher than what they are for infill tests. But we we start to see that, that this gap is, is shrinking. So dealing with larger amounts of, of test data efficiently is a problem that's kind of spreading, I would say, from, from manufacturing tests and into in-system tests. So, so to have that like highway across the chip to, to be able to, to send massive amounts of data uh, test data is is something that you know is a requirement or becoming a requirement for for in system tests as well. What does the architecture actually look like when you're trying to move to design for test data? Yeah, so uh, when we really try to focus on um, on getting test data uh, efficiently distributed across the chip, uh, where we generally see a, a trend today is towards some sort of packetized scan test delivery. This uh, shows uh, a, an implementation of that called the, the streaming scan network. But this is a very simple illustration of design with six uh, blocks, six cores. And inside of each core, you've got the same uh, scan chains and, and same compression circuitry as you traditionally have. But what, what's new is how scan data flows from the IOs of the chips and into each of these cores. And the, the idea here for any type of, of packetized delivery system is 
there is a, a bus of, of sorts. Uh, in this case, we, we call it the SSN bus. And in each of the cores, there is a, a node, uh, a host node that uh, picks up the right data from the bus, the data corresponding to or targeted that particular core and delivers it to the local uh, scan chains and, and also picks up the results and put them back on the bus. And the idea here is that whether you are testing just one core or you're testing multiple cores at the same time, the data will still flow across this bus. And you know, in some cases, again, it will data it, uh, will be sent that is targeted multiple cores, sometimes only, only one core. And the basic idea is that this decision on whether you test one or more cores at the same time, it's not a hardwired decision. It's something that is kind of decided in, in, in the patterns themselves. You've got a lot of different types of data. You've got a lot of data. How does this actually move through what you're trying to test? Yeah, so, so let me show you an, an example here. I'm going to zoom in on a slightly you know, simpler design now just with, with two cores. In this case, again, we're uh, looking, uh, looking at scan data. And we let's assume we want to test both of these cores at, at the same time. And in this case, we're trying to make it a little bit interesting in that we, we got a, a bus that's eight bits wide. And we got one core with, with four scan channels and one with five. And in, you know, in, in, in a kind of direct pinmux approach, if you want to test these two cores at the same time, you, you would well, either need nine pins or you would you know, have to go back and change one of them. Now, with, with a, a packetized approach, the idea is that you, you are not kind of restricted, but you don't need that one-to-one -one mapping. Now, so in, in case of the, the SSN architecture, so that, that's one specific implementation of packetized test, how this works is that the there is a programming step that that configures that's that green line here that that con configures each of these nodes so that they know what data belongs to what core. So rather than sending like address and data in in each packet, what's being sent is is just a payload. So what that looks like is that if I want to send the first set of data to, to these two cores, I need a total of nine bits. And my packet now will be kind of wrapped around the bus. Again, I got eight bits on the first cycle of the bus, and I got one bit for the next cycle. For the next packet, you will notice that the, the location of, of the bits uh, has, has rotated. Now you see a, a shift here. And this rotation will continue packet by packet. Um, it, the, uh, the host nodes themselves understand this concept, understand like how this data will, will rotate. And that, that's what kind of allows us to now have a complete independence of like how many bits are needed per core and, and the size of the bus. Uh, so in this case, you'll notice each packet is two uh, bus cycles uh, or takes two bus cycles. In a bigger design, it could be could be much more. So kind of looking here just at, at the input data. Now the, the output data is now using the same time slots on the bus, if you will. So the kind of the output data for, for the first packet is kind of using the the same slots on the bus just uh, two uh, two packets later. So this kind of rotation here kind of continues on and on. And and again the so, you know, a couple of things you will you will notice here. One is, for instance, that if you imagine a design with even more cores and not just these two, the the size of the packet could be multiple bus cycles, and that actually allows you now to shift. Uh, even though you can only shift the core still at let's say 100 megahertz, you can shift uh, data across this bus and pump data into the chip at a much higher frequency. So, so for instance, you could imagine 400 megahertz going into the chip uh, distributed across the design at, at 400 megahertz and still kind of maintain a 100 megahertz local shift frequency. So this, this gets you towards that kind of independence between the speed on the highway, like the speed on this bus, 
and uh, the speed on the local side roads, the local scan chains. Over time, you may use these chips differently. I mean, one of the things about having chips in the market for 10 years and having AI is they adapt. They're supposed to, to change over time and optimize. Does the test now have the ability to change as well? It, it most certainly does. And uh, you know, how you could en envision that the test changes is that you, you would, for instance, uh, target more test data for uh, one core than another core kind of later in, in the process. One of the things you, you can imagine happen over time is uh, to change how much test data is sent to one core versus another. So for instance, for, for the initial manufacturing test, you got the same amount of test data for, for two cores. And like in a conventional implementation, you would then you know, allocate about the same number of pins, for instance, to, to those cores and things would be, uh, would be balanced. Now, if you then start to, you know, you realize that uh, it makes sense to, to tune the patterns differently, provide more uh, or less patterns to, to some cores, uh, you might end up with, with a situation that, you know, looks to what you see on the right-hand side here, that if you're testing these cores at the same time, uh, some of them need, and the blue line here is the number of cycles needed per core. You know, some of them need more, more uh, test data, more cycles than the other. So even though you tune this initially when you made your design, then it turns out that that tuning, you know, didn't work. So the ability that you want is, you know, what you what you see here on on the left, right? You kind of want this this valve here, like have some sort of valve that allows you to achieve your goal, which is that you want to fill, have, make sure that all these buckets are full at the same time. And you want to achieve that by, you know, opening up some valves more than the other, right? And so the test cycle equivalent of that is something that looks more like this, right? Where you have a much closer balance, you kind of tuned how much data to, goes to what, what core more, more elegantly. You know, with, with a packetized approach, um, like as I said, you, you can achieve that by, by changing some of the things I just told you, because you know, I, I told you that you would you know, allocate, you know, have as many bits in the packet as you, you got pins for each core. So in that example we talked about, the packet size was nine bits because you got four pins and one test pins in one core and, and five in the other. So if now, for instance, you know, core B here is that, that big bucket and core A is, is a small bucket, what you can do is instead of putting five bits per packet for core A, you can close the valve a little bit and give it, let's say, four or three or two bits per packet. And, and that way you, you make the packet smaller, which means you can kind of go through all of the packets at the same time. So the end result is that now, these two buckets are end up being filled at the same time. Gerard, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome. Thank you for, for having me.